Okay, good afternoon everybody. My name is Nate Berkepeck, uh, and this presentation will be an introduction to benchmarking and profiling in the Ruby language. If you're not familiar with me or my work, I am a Ruby and Rails performance consultant. Uh, I've been doing that for the last four years or so. I wrote a book called The Complete Guide to Rails Performance, uh, and I consulted companies large and small uh, to make their Ruby web applications faster. I'm also doing a nationwide workshop tour this summer uh, so if you like what you've seen today, you can get the full version at one of my workshops this summer. The workshop is focused on measurement and diagnosis of performance problems, which is what we're going to get into just a little bit today. Uh, as you'll see, can I get my timer as well? Um, as you'll see, there's also one workshop two days from now on Friday here at the Hyatt Regency. Uh, I have just a few more tickets available for that one, so please talk to me if you're interested in staying an extra day and attending that workshop. Okay, so today, my objective is to give you enough of a roadmap on the topics of benchmarking and profiling for you to go home, open up the Rails application, and get a good idea of where to start, what to Google for uh, when you get stuck. I can't cover the complete basics of benchmarking and profiling, particularly the specifics of how to use each individual tool. Um, I think you're all smart enough and good enough programmers to go home and you know, read or read me to get the exact specifics of how to use each specific tool. Uh, but today we're going to kind of cover at least how these, what, what tools exist, uh, what they're good for, and what they can tell you about your application. And although this is RailsConf, uh, I, nothing I'm going to be presenting here is specific uh, to Rails. So I want to begin with a story about one of the most famous computing projects of all time, the Apollo guidance computer, and how a performance bug almost caused an abort of the very first moon landing. The AGC is famous for having uh, extremely low computing resources, one processor running at 1.1 megahertz, 36 kilobytes of memory, and two kilobytes of RAM. However, it was one of the first ever computers that implemented a concurrency architecture that was not based on time slicing. Time slicing is a technique uh, where you divide a second into smaller increments or slices and then allocate time evenly between those slices. But that wasn't going to work for a real-time uh, application like the moon landing. Previous design, uh, so Hal, Hal Lanning, a software engineer at MIT, devised a new method which he called the executive. It was one of the first ever implementations of cooperative concurrency and its design became extremely important during the landing of Apollo 11, as dramatized uh, in the movie First Man, which I'm about to show you. Pay attention here to the error codes that the astronauts call out during the landing. One. Zero. Ignition. Can give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. Game alarm. Roger, we're going at alarm. So two astronauts are hurtling down towards the surface of the moon, and they get an error code that they've never seen before. Uh, five times in two minutes during the final descent of Apollo 11, a software error occurred and five times the Apollo guidance computer had to be soft restarted. These errors were of the 1201 and 1202 error code classes. When Neil Armstrong radioed that down to Houston and asked what to do, Mission Control radioed back that it was a go. What doesn't show up in this transcript 
is that a 24-year-old computer programmer named Jack Garman at the back of Mission Control told the guidance controller that the error code was a go and it was fine as long as it didn't occur continuously. So there was only one person at the back of Mission Control that knew, no, it's fine, don't abort the moon landing. Although we didn't have time to check it, Flight Director Gene Kranz actually had a sheet of paper taped to his desk that listed the various alarm codes that the AGC might raise during the descent. Among these was the 1201 and 1202 codes. That sheet said that these error codes were an overflow of the available memory for active work and that they would cause an automatic soft reset of the AGC. The 1201 and 1202 error codes noted that the duty cycle may be up to the point of missing some functions. In essence, the AGC was being overloaded. The bailout routine, which is the subroutine that was called automatically after these 1201 and 1202 error codes was raised, uh, it's called when the AGC runs out of core sets. The AGC had eight of these core sets. Uh, they were just areas that would, uh, where you could store a small amount of data related to a single job or task. So in effect, the AGC had a job queue that was eight jobs deep. If the AGC became overloaded and a, had too much work to do, the number of core sets in use would keep increasing until someone in, tried to enqueue a ninth job. Uh, when that happened, bailout was called and the AGC would reset itself clearing the core sets. The 1201 and 1202 errors raised when the age, what were raised when the AGC was running on program 63. That was the guidance mode that they would use to slow down the lunar uh, module during descent. Uh, it was the most taxing period of the entire Apollo mission on the AGC's measly hardware. This is a graph of a simulation of the Apollo guidance computer's computer utilization during descent. So the top line here is CPU utilization. Uh, back then, the AGC engineers called that the duty cycle. During the final phase of the descent, the AGC was expected to see 90% of its available CPU cycles used. The fact that the 1202 and 1201 errors were being raised meant that that duty cycle had exceeded 100%. During the lunar descent, the astronauts were on a hair trigger to abort the mission in case of a safety issue. The astronauts, specifically the LM pilot Buzz Aldrin, had lobbied the engineers that uh, during the descent, the rendezvous radar would be turned on. So this rendezvous radar tracked the command module, uh, which was orbiting above them, during the descent in case they had to have an abort. So if there was an abort, they wanted to know where the command module was so they could reposition the lunar module to rendezvous with the uh, command module and get back to Earth. So keeping the rendezvous radar on was sort of uh, increasing the chances of a successful abort should it be needed. However, there was a bug in the rendezvous radar. As the lunar module tilted forward, the rendezvous radar pointed out into space rather than pointing at the uh, command module. This change in angle combined with an extremely obscure bug in the power supply to the rendezvous radar caused an overload of tasks and data to enqueue into the AGC. Later analysis would show that the rendezvous radar was taking up 13% of the available duty cycle uh, with these spurious jobs that the rendezvous radar was creating, which was 3% more than they had available. Now, I'm sure everyone here has never had some super wacky shit take down their application in production. <laughs> the story of the 1202 program alarm reminds us that no amount of performance work outside of the production context will always catch every single performance bug. One of the disadvantages of Hal Landing's executive design was that it was non-deterministic. While the Apollo engineers ran a lot of simulations, they could never perfectly replicate the conditions of the moon landing. One of the main objections I get when I teach people about benchmarking and profiling is they don't like that the perf bug has to happen first in production before we can replicate it on their machines in development. They'd rather do load testing and try to find these things before they happen. But as the Apollo story shows us, load testing is not reality. Simulation is not reality. 
only reality is reality. Another thing I get a lot from people when I start talking about benchmarking and profiling is that people would rather learn the solutions themselves. They want me to give them the tips and the tricks and the one weird solution that will fix all of their Rails performance bugs. This is a list of the 321 optimization passes that the GCC compiler makes on every line of C code. Uh, this list was provided by Vladimir Makarov of Red Hat. He's working on a JIT for uh, Ruby. Each of these GCC compiler passes makes a very small tweak, a small check, optimize one thing here, optimize one thing there, and it does it 321 times. But we are not compilers. Uh, I could teach you 320 things to look at on every single line of Ruby code, but you wouldn't remember 320, you wouldn't remember 32, you probably wouldn't remember three. Uh, and I cannot just stand up here and teach you all these things and you can go home and run each of these mental models on every single line of code that you're ever gonna write. Um, because the other problem is that I can teach you 300 things, but really it's more like 3,000 things for every, for every line of code that could possibly go wrong. And uh, you're probably not even gonna remember three of them. What I'm trying to get at here is that all performance work without measurement is premature. This is what we talk about when we're talking about premature optimization. If you haven't measured, if you haven't proven the problem, working on it is premature. So that's why measurement, benchmarking, and profiling are the foundational performance skills. That's where I start everybody when I'm teaching performance work. It also saves us time. Um, the number one thing that probably stops people from working more on performance is when they start working on it, uh, they start saying like, oh, I've you know, sped up this part of the code by 10x, and they, they, then they deploy it, and it makes no difference to the application. Because they weren't paying attention to what was happening in production. Uh, what the method I'm going to teach you here today is to measure twice and PR once. Um, if I can show you how to measure, show you how to replicate in development, it's going to be far more likely that the work that you're going to do on, production, on improving performance in production is going to actually work when you actually deploy it. Okay, so let's do some definitions. A benchmark is a synthetic measurement of the resources or time consumed by a defined procedure. So synthetic is obviously a key word here. Um, benchmarks are usually not intended to replicate a exact production process. It's usually a lot more granular than that. Um, and we can measure not just time consumed, so iterations per second or how long it took to do a thing. We can also measure the resources it consumes and benchmarks that. So we can say, hey, this process allocated this many objects. It took up this much memory. That's also a benchmark. Um, and it's over a defined procedure. Uh, so one line of code, one controller action, and we're gonna do that multiple times in our benchmark. Profiles are different. So a profile is a step-by-step -step accounting of the relative consumption of resources by a procedure's many subroutines. So step-by-step -step accounting. Rather than getting one number at the end of like iterations per second or memory consumed, we're gonna get a lot of numbers. It's gonna be like a, uh, a quite a lot of data that says, hey, we spent 10% of our time here, 5% of our time here, 1% here. Uh, and we can get that at an extremely granular level depending on the tool. So we can get numbers, you know, that are down to the line number. Um, and I use the word relative consumption there because the way most profilers work um, is that they'll tell you you spent 10% of your time here, but it's 10% relative to, you know, uh, one execution of the entire operation. So it's not gonna say, uh, we spent 100 milliseconds of time here like you would in, in a benchmark. It gives you an absolute time number. Profile numbers tend to be relative. And we can also do resources here so we can profile memory, we can profile time. Um, and it's gonna usually, we're gonna think about profiles in terms of subroutines, which means in the Ruby context, methods. So you're gonna look at how much time you spend in certain methods and certain modules, uh, and it'll give us a breakdown of, of uh, where time was spent. So the overall process I want to teach you today uh, is this. We're gonna start with reading production metrics. Uh, if you're not looking at metrics in production, and if you're not um, looking at uh, 
what actually happens to users and what, what actually code is slow for them, then you're optimizing prematurely, you're working on code that if you make it 10 times faster, maybe it only gets called one in a million times. So making that part of the app 10 times faster was probably just a waste of your time. Um, everyone here should be using one of New Relic, Skylight, Scout, and Production. Um, those are the tools that give you these production metrics to make these informed decisions. Um, once you've got from those tools, you say, hey, our search action is too slow. Then you can move to the next step and profile that locally to figure out well, what part of it's slow. Search takes 1,500 milliseconds. Okay, well, what part of that is slow? Uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't help to just know that it's slow. You need to know what line is causing that slowness. That's where profiling comes in. Once we identify from the profile what parts of the code are slow, then we're gonna take those slow parts and make a benchmark for them. So if we identify in our slow search action that the part that's actually slow is not the search, it's the rendering of the results. So one benchmark we might do is how long does it take to render one line of the result? Okay, that'll be our benchmark. Once we have the benchmark, it's extremely easy and fast to iterate on the solution because we have an actual number. So we can say, hey, this rendering of the result, we could do that in a thousand iterations per second uh, on master when we started. And once we, you know, we've done my amazing solution and now it's uh, two million iterations per second, great. Um, and then, so we know it's faster and then we can deploy that change. So, profiling answers what is slow. Um, these production uh, profiling tools normally can't give you that much detail. Um, profiling adds overhead. Uh, it by necessity has to because you're no, you're no longer doing just the work. You're now doing the work and then analyzing the work at the same time. You're recording what happened. So that's more work than you were doing before, therefore profiling by necessity will add work and make your app slower. Um, so these production profilers like Skylight, New Relic, Scout, uh, all have to make a trade-off and they'll, they'll tend to give you less data so that they don't impact your production users. But in development, we don't care about that. Uh, we can add a lot more overhead to give us more accurate data. So when we're profiling development, we're gonna answer the question, what is slow? To answer that question accurately, we have to have an accurate profiling environment. An accurate profiling environment is one that looks and works in an as production-like way as possible. Um, one of the biggest parts of this is the data. So probably the majority, I would say, of Rails uh, performance problems are related to active record, which means they are related to data. Uh, and it means that the data in the database has to look kind of like production. Um, when we call user.all, we need to get the same amount of rows back as we would in production to whatever sane extent we can. I know if you work at Shopify, that's not a sane thing to do in development, but it needs to be more than 10. You know, it needs to be more than 10 rows when you call user.all because uh, if that happens in production for real, that would be very bad. Uh, so production-like data, you can either download production uh, dumps and just throw them into your development database if you're cool with that. If you're not, um, I've seen people uh, have an automated process for downloading production dumps and then eliminating the PII. Could be just dropping the user table. That's what rubygems.org does, is they just drop the tables from the dump that are uh, uh, sensitive. Um, it could be you know, going through and changing every email to some random string or whatever. Another approach is to have an actually good database seed file. That's the most difficult approach because it has to be good and like create millions of rows and that takes a long time. So it's probably the least realistic option, but if you work in that kind of environment where you have to do that and not use real data, then that's what you're stuck with. The other thing that has to work the same is the code. Um, these are some settings in particular that cause uh, development mode to work in a non-production-like way. Um, in the, I actually had a talk with someone yesterday about this. Personally, I just go into production uh, environments slash production.rb and just hack it until it runs in development um, so that I'm working in a production-like code. Uh, but then you can't check it in, so it's not really a sustainable solution for teams. Um, what I've seen people do that actually works is they go into development.rb and then have an, uh, these changes behind an env variable. 
So it'll say, you know, if env profile is set, then change the setting to this. Um, and then so in development mode, they can get some production-like code behavior. So the things that uh, make profiles in development look wrong and look not production-like are code reloading, um, asset pre-compilation, so sprockets, you're gonna have to turn it off and uh, pre-compile -pre your assets, and uh, active, record, active record migrations, so if you don't turn that off, you're gonna see this uh, thing at the beginning of every profile that's checking for if there's been a migration or not. So turning all those things off makes the code behave in a slightly more production-like way, gets all the cruft out of our profiles, um, and gives us a more accurate result that looks more production-like. There are two modes um, for measuring time in almost all profilers, CPU and wall time. CPU time counts time based on CPU cycles. So that means that things like I.O. and sleeping don't show up in those profiles because no time has passed uh, relative to how many CPU cycles have occurred uh, for this process. Wall time is based on the clock on the wall, stopwatch time. Uh, so everything shows up, um, you know, waiting on I.O., sleeping, that, that all counts in a, CP, in a wall profile. So if we have a method that sleeps for four seconds, uh, if we profile this with a wall profiler, a wall time profiler, uh, it will say this method took four seconds to execute. Uh, this is example output from uh, Ruby prof. Uh, if we had uh, this in CPU time mode, it would look like this method took zero seconds to execute because it spent zero time on the CPU. Uh, which makes uh, CPU time profiling useful when you want to take IO out of the equation. Uh, sometimes you don't want to do that, sometimes it is relevant that calling user dot some scope takes 300 milliseconds, you want to keep that in the profile. Sometimes it doesn't if you're profiling a database driver, for example, you don't care how long it takes for the time for the acts, uh, actually takes for the, uh, uh, CP, the database to come back with a response, use a CPU time profiler. There are two uh, designs for profilers. This is true of any profiler, not just in Ruby. Uh, there are statistical and tracing profilers. Statistical profilers sample a percentage of uh, the available stack frame. So basically every millisecond or 10 milliseconds, they interrupt your process, record the stack frame, and then allow the process to continue. Uh, then all of those stack frames get aggregated into the profile. Uh, a tracing profiler actually hooks into the language runtime and actually every time you call a method, it says, hey, you called string plus and increments that counter by one and records the stack when, when that happened. So tracing profilers can actually uh, record every single thing that happens. With a tracing profiler, you'll see this method was called 3,092 times. Uh, with a statistical profile, you can't get that level of detail because it only sampled you know, maybe 1% of the available stack frames and it's inferring the rest of them statistically therefore a statistical profiler. We have two main profilers in the Ruby world that we use in development. They're StackProf and RubyProf. StackProf is statistical, RubyProf is tracing. Um, I like them both for different reasons. Um, they both have different styles of output. One is statistical, one is tracing. Um, I would encourage you to give a shot uh, to both uh, because they're, you'll see that they're both useful for uh, different um, tool, different uh, problems. This is what StackProf's output looks like when you use it with Rack Mini Profiler, which is another tool I'm gonna talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, this is a flame graph, so each one of these little bars is one stack recording. Uh, each uh, horizontal line is one part of the stack. What you're looking at when you're looking at a flame graph is what you wanna, see, what you wanna pay attention to is any long, flat sections? Because a well, long, flat section means that one function took a long amount of time to execute, so that's interesting. You might wanna uh, dig in a bit more on that. If you zoom in here, you'll actually see the actual line that, uh, uh, for each layer of the stack. So you would zoom in there and say, all right, we spent a lot of time you know, executing this function. Let's go check it out. The other thing I like to look at when I look at flame graphs is repeated shapes. So we've got a repeated shape here uh, of like four or five times, it does this sort of up and down, it's in similar parts of the code. That's interesting because that means we're in a loop, 
that took a lot of time. If we can make that loop faster, then we can speed up this part of the code. This is what the output of um, RubyProf looks like when you use its call stack visualizer. It's one of my favorite visualizers for RubyProf. I use it all the time. Um, so each one of these lines here is one layer of the stack. Uh, there are some numbers here which you're not gonna be able to read from the back, but basically on each line of the stack, it tells you how much time uh, was spent in this stack layer and its children um, of the to per what percentage of the total profile, and then what percentage uh, was spent in this stack relative to the parent. So what you're kind of looking for in that call stack profile is if one line says we spent 98% of our time in this stack or its children, and then the next line says we spent 90% of our time in, the call, in this call stack or its children, it means we lost 8% there. So we spent 8% of our time in this call stack. So that's interesting, I would dig in more there, maybe benchmark that part of the app. Try different views, try different formats. Uh, one format, one profiler is not perfect for all problems. You have to try different ones. I've noticed some people just work better with different profilers. I guess it just, you know, some people are more visual, some people want to see the graph. Um, so just give them all a, a, a shot. We can also profile memory. Um, Richard talked a little bit more about this in his talk today. I would go back and watch that if you hadn't seen it. Um, but just a reminder, we can profile not just time, but also resources. The memory profiler gem is probably the best way we have in Ruby right now to do that. Uh, the best way to interact with memory profiler and stack prof right now is the rack mini profiler gem. It's the number one thing I think everyone should be using on their Rails applications. Uh, it adds a little badge to the upper left that gives you an easy to use interface for the memory profiler and stack prof gems to look at any controller action and profile them uh, as quickly as possible. All right, now, talk about benchmarking. There are three kinds of benchmark. Uh, micro, macro, and app. There are different levels of scope. So I would say a micro benchmark is one that runs just one to 100 lines of Ruby code before it iterates again, um, and I don't mean one, you know, 100 lines of Ruby code in the benchmark that you wrote, but, you know, if you have one line in the benchmark, that calls out to up to 100 lines of code before it iterates again. Micro benchmarks will iterate, you know, one million times per second or more. Um, they're very dangerous um, because they can mislead you about how big of an impact they're gonna have. Uh, if you have one million iterations per second on a piece of code and you turn that into two million, that's a 2x improvement, but if that particular line of code is only executed once during a controller action, that's gonna have almost no impact at all um, on that controller action. A macro benchmark is, uh, I would say, you know, anywhere between 1,000 to 1 million iterations per second. It probably runs a couple thousand lines of Ruby code before executing. Macro benchmarks are probably the kind that I write the most. It might be like one call to a service object or you know, uh, one method on a uh, user model. Um, they're bigger than micro benchmarks, but they're uh, small enough that they're not an entire controller action. An entire controller action I would call an app benchmark. Um, those maybe iterate only a couple hundred times per second. Um, they're useful, um, but uh, at some point, you're just sort of uh, have too much in the benchmark, and making changes to the code may not result in a very big change to the benchmark itself uh, because so many other lines of code are running. So, this is Benchmark IPS. It's my preferred benchmarking tool written by Evan Phoenix. Um, this line right here uh, is the default config options for time and warmup. Benchmark IPS will run your code once as a warmup and then discard the result. It does that because uh, it needs to fill up caches, it needs to load your code, uh, and all that, the first run of any piece of code will always be slower than the second run, and so on and so forth, until eventually it reaches a steady state. So getting to that steady state is what the warmup is all about, and Benchmark IPS does that for you. Then we run the benchmark itself by default for five seconds. So each of these blocks here are gonna get benchmarked against each other. This is an actual benchmark from a gem I used to maintain. 
Uh, so each of these benchmarks will get run for five seconds and record the result. The output looks a little bit like this. So this is the warm-up phase right here. And then uh, this is the actual benchmark itself. And then it compares them for you at the end. And we'll do a sort of really basic statistical test to tell you whether or not this result is probably important. The benchmark slash IPSA gem adds this little bit on top which measures the allocations of one run of that benchmark. It's super cool. Um, as Richard's talk talked about this morning, object allocations tend to correlate directly with time consumed. So I like to add this in as sort of a little idea of, hey, maybe this, the reason, you know, my logs benchmark here is slow is because it's allocating so many more objects than this one, uh, this, uh, this, this simple uh, benchmark. So again, we can benchmark not just time, also resources. That, again, that benchmark uh, gem is called benchmark IPSA. The warm-up and benchmark time uh, parameters for benchmark IPS are usually fine for 95% of uh, the benchmarks you're going to write. If you want to change the warm-up time, you're going to change it because uh, it needs to be longer to keep the results stable. If the warm-up time isn't long enough, uh, the initial, you know, thousand or million runs of the code are going to be slower than the next thousand or hundred million, or next thousand or million executions of it. So basically, you want to end the warm up when the uh, iteration speed is stable. Two seconds is usually enough for C Ruby, but if you're on JRuby, if you're benchmarking Truffle Ruby, uh, or if you're using Ruby 2.6 in JIT mode, uh, those. Uh, run times need more time to get to a steady state because of what they're doing under the hood. So you might need a warm-up time of 10 seconds. Truffle Ruby seems to need really long warm-up times of like 30 seconds. Um, so that's why you would change that parameter. Benchmark time generally should just be long enough to uh, keep the variance of the result low. You might have seen uh, in that benchmark result here that we get a little uh, plus or minus uh, margin of error here. If that number is high, like it is here, um, in this case it's plus or minus 20%, I like to see it at less than 5%. But if it's really high, sometimes all you need is just to run the benchmark for a little bit longer, and then you can get that statistical noise out, um, especially if it's a fairly low iterations per second, like this, this benchmark is. Um, so I would sometimes increase the benchmark time just to get rid of some of that variance, um, especially when we're running app-level benchmarks that only iterate 10 times um, per second. Okay, my number one benchmarking tip, beware the loop. Uh, you have to be aware of what is being run in the benchmark loop, and be sure that what's being run in there is actually what you want to measure. Because if you have extra overhead being run in the benchmark, then the overhead is going to obscure the speed difference you're, uh, that's going to be gained by the changes that you're making. So, huge mistake I see in most people's benchmarks when I teach them this for the first time. Uh, active record inside of the uh, benchmark loop. So the difference between this line and this line is that we're doing an active record lookup every single time we uh, run uh, that piece of code. Now, the active record query cache is going to catch this. You're not actually going to go to the database back and forth every time, but there's still a lot more code that's being run here than is being run here. And if you don't actually care about how fast Active Record looks up stuff, and what you really came here to benchmark was the do thing method, then get this stuff out of the benchmark loop, okay? So be, pay very careful attention to what overhead is being uh, done inside of each iteration, and get out as much of it as you can so that you're only measuring the stuff that you actually care about. I think most apps should have a benchmarks folder. Um, if you do get into the habit of writing benchmarks for your performance-related changes, which I, I hope that you do, um, it's be a shame if you just threw those away at the end of every pull request. Um, they can be very valuable tools for measuring changes over time. Just check them into a benchmarks folder and let them live there. Um, some people ask me about, you know, what's like a fancy CI setup I can have to run my benchmarks every time I push to CI. That's cool if you can figure that out, but it's also cool if, you know, Somebody says, hey, there's a benchmarks in the benchmarks folder for this. Can you run that and post the results on this feature branch uh, just for, you know, to, to check it? What happens in, in apps is it tends to be that the same parts get touched over and over for performance reasons. 
So it really doesn't take that many benchmarks to cover the important parts of an app. Just check them in, know that they're there, uh, try to use them in your PRs for the future. Um, just checking them in can be a, a really big increase in organizational knowledge for the team. Okay, so this was the process that I've laid out today. Read production metrics, turn that into a profile in development to figure out what part of the action is slow, create a benchmark once you've figured out the slow part, create a benchmark for it, then iterate on that benchmark, try to change some code, see if you can make the benchmark faster. Once you have, deploy, start the process over again. This is just the scientific method of observe, create an experiment, run the experiment, and uh, observe it again. Uh, we can also short circuit this method this at any point when we just have figured it out. Like, I've looked at enough Rails applications that frequently all I have to do is look at the production metrics to know what's wrong and what to fix. Uh, but there's also times when I come up on stuff, it's like, I don't even know why this action's slow. As long as I don't know, I'm going to keep going to the next step, okay? Once you know, you can, you can bail out. Um, at some point, when you're in a big enough team or you're making a PR to a big enough project or a project that's not your own, uh, they're gonna wanna see the numbers anyway. Um, so like if you make a performance PR to Rails, they're just gonna tell you, please come back with a benchmark. Um, and that's fine, that's, that's the only way that Rails could possibly work on this rather than people just telling them some code is faster. Uh, so you might have to create a benchmark to work with your team, but uh, in small teams or on your own projects, just go as far as you need to to figure out um, what the solution is. Okay, so this is what we talked about today. I've hopefully convinced you uh, why measurement is important. I've talked about the differences between benchmarking and profiling, what tools are available, and a brief introduction as to what, uh, how to use them. And uh, a little bit on profiling, a little bit on benchmarking, the terms used, um, and uh, how to uh, do those things. After Apollo 11 landed, a frantic search began at Mission Control to figure out what had caused those 1201 and 1202 program alarms. Luckily, Apollo was built with a kind of production profiler. The Apollo guidance computer was constantly sending down data about its own state to Mission Control, and they looked at that data, and one of the engineers noticed that this bit was flipped to a weird value, and it was the value of whether the rendezvous radar was on or not. The engineers didn't actually know that the astronauts were flipping the rendezvous radar to the position where it was tracking the CSM. Uh, the astronauts had changed that and basically not told anybody uh, that was working on the software. The Apollo landing was never actually tested with a real working rendezvous radar, uh, so when the astronauts were testing this procedure, they would flip the rendezvous radar switch, but it was a dummy switch. The lesson is not that we can and should test every possible production state. The lesson here is that it is impossible. Even with the massive manpower and cash resources of the Apollo program and literally only 36 kilobytes of code, they couldn't figure out every possible permutation of, of state that could possibly impact the uh, performance of the Apollo lander. Instead, we can build software that fails gracefully and then try to recreate the pieces in development using profilers and benchmarks, and use those to study and replicate what happened in production. That has been my talk. Thank you very much.